LVADs. Um, this is sort of LVADs 101 for those of you that are doing rounds on the weekend and have to round on the um, So a couple disclosures. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. Um, and uh, these devices aren't perfect. I'm going to come out and say it. Um, so we'll talk briefly about um, just what are the components of the LVADs, um, common complications, um, and really just some practical considerations when you have to see um, of these patients. Um, currently, LVADs uh, in Canada are used uh, as a bridge to transplant, um, as a bridge to candidacy for transplant, rarely, but on occasion, uh, to recovery uh, and or um, destination therapy, which is the latest sort of indication. Uh, in the United States, probably 40 to 50 percent of the devices that they put in are destination VADs. So the patients will live with the VAD until they die. Um, and that's their uh, final goal. Uh, at the Heart Institute currently, we're putting in 10 to 15 devices a year. This is, is uh, a goal to be uh, increased in a couple years, but that's what we've sort of averaged in the past two years. Currently, we have about uh, eight patients in the community and one or two patients in-house. We have about 10 patients floating around. Um, so when we talk about the components of the VAD, um, the device is placed in parallel to the native circulation. So there's an inflow cannula, there's a pump, um, there's an outflow graft, and then there's all the, the components to power the device. So we put in two different types of devices here. Um, one is the HeartMate 2. So you have an inflow cannula here, it's this part here. Um, the device sits here where the rotor is, an outflow graft that connects to the ascending aorta, power line that runs here to an external controller that's attached to two batteries. Um, the HeartMate device um, has sort of an, an impella um, rotor that sits in here. Um, it's an axillary device, so the flow runs parallel um, to um, the device sits in the subdiaphragmatic position, so it's a bit more of a bulky design, device, not ideal for um, or, or tiny men. Um, the hardware device, it's our other device that we can use, much more smaller, lower profile, fits in the palm of my hand easily. Um, it's placed in the intra, sorry, intrapericardial space, so you don't have to worry about being, having a subdiaphragmatic pocket. Again, there's the device. Um, the inflow cannula is here that sits in the LV. This is a centrifugal device. So the device spins here and the blood comes down perpendicular to where the device is spinning. Then it's um, shot outside the outflow cannula back into the ascending aorta. And it has a similar configuration in terms of it has a drive line that comes outside the abdomen and then is attached to a controller and two batteries. Here's what it looks like on x-ray so you can see um, HeartMate 2 device sits subdiaphragmatically, much more bulky, and then the hardware device, which is much smaller. Well, all devices require batteries. Um, they have to be attached to a battery source at all times or the device will not run. Um, they have to be attached to two batteries. It can run off of one battery for a very short period of time, i.e. 60 seconds. But in general, both batteries must be attached or they have to be attached to an external power source to run. So if you see the patients in their room, they'll either be attached to the external power source, plugged into the wall basically, or they'll have two batteries attached to them. Um, they have a controller that um, uh, looks a little different depending upon the device. This is the hardware um, controller. This is the HeartMate 2 controller. On this controller will be a couple numbers that you can see um, that, that tell you the parameters of the device. This is an example of the HeartWare device. On this device, you'll s and, and the HeartMate 2 is similar, you just have to toggle through with a button. Um, it'll tell you the flow or, the, or so the speed of the device. So the HeartWare, this for example, this would be set at 3,000 RPMs or revolutions per minute. The calculated flow um, and the power in this particular device. For the HeartMate 2 devices, the numbers are a little different. So we run those usually somewhere between 9200 and 9600 RPM. The uh, hardware device, the flows are, are lower, 3200 to 4400 um, RPM. 
and then the flow will range anywhere from three to eight liters per minute. The flow is calculated, so it doesn't really measure the flow. So the flow is based on, on in vitro studies um, or in vivo studies where they look at a particular RPM and a particular uh, power and what kind of flow do they get for that. So it's not that we're actually truly measuring that, those flows. Um, the hemodynamics of these patients are interesting. Um, because the flow or, or the devices spin continuously, it's a continuous flow and the patients don't have a pulse. Um, so the only way to uh, assess that is by Doppler and you'll measure a mean arterial pressure, um, but do not expect them to have a pulse. And in fact, if they do have a pulse, that's probably abnormal. Probably means that the device is not working as well as it should or they have inherent contractility that's returning. They're uh, exceptionally preload sensitive. So if you're having low pressures, low flows, inherently the easiest thing to do is just give them volume. Um, similarly, they're very afterload sensitive. So the flow across the device is dependent upon the differential pressure between the LV and the aorta. As the afterload goes up, the flow across the device will fall. The device does not have a way to ramp up or ramp down per se. It's fixed speed. So if you increase afterload, your flow will fall. So um, we try and target blood maps between 70 and 90. The risk of stroke, the risk of thrombus, everything increases as you go, uh, well, or as your blood pressure increases because of fall. You're rounding on the patients on the ward. They'll have a little uh, chart outside um, where their vital signs will be recorded. And these parameters should be recorded on that chart every day. So there should be a map measured by Doppler that the nurses will take. The pump speed should be recorded, so it'll be somewhere between 9,000 or low 3,000s, depending upon the device that they have. The flow, which is calculated by the device, should be recorded in liters per minute, usually somewhere around four. And the power. The power number, um, most of our patients have powers somewhere around six, seven. Um, the important thing is to look at the trend. So if you're seeing powers that are going up by an absolute of more than two or a double digit power value, that's abnormal. Um, and then if uh, they have a HeartMate 2 device, they'll record a pulsatility index, which is a number that reflects um, how much is the native heart contributing. If you have decreased plea road, that will fall. Um, I, if uh, you have increased afterload, that may fall. Um, if the pump speed is altered, the pulsatility index will change because uh, the amount that the native heart has to contribute will change. So again, it's, it's just another clue as to um, what's going on in the hemodynamics of that particular patient and value is when you start. Complications are frequent. Um, certainly the most common that we see are infection, um, driveline infection or device infection, and bleeding. Um, depending upon the cohort that you look at, up to 30% of patients will have bleeding in the first year, maybe even higher in some cases. Um, most often this is uh, gastrointestinal. Multiple mechanisms have been proposed, but the common one, uh, current thinking anyways, um, would be AV valve formations, an acquired von Willebrand deficiency, or hemolysis of thrombus in the device. And so we measure LDH, bilirubin, hemoglobin, haptoglobin um, on a regular basis in these patients. And again, important. Um, an LDH greater than 500 has been shown to have good sensitivity for um, the presence of thrombus, although not necessarily specific. Similarly, stroke uh, is, a, is a complication, a little bit less with the newer generation devices compared to the previous iteration, but certainly still a, com a complication. Thrombus, um, either subacute or acute thrombus, uh, thrombosis of the device, um, arrhythmia, um, and then long-term aortic regurgitation and or RV failure. These devices will only support the LV. So if you have an RV that is impaired, it suddenly is going to have a bunch of preload that it wasn't accustomed to, could dilate, um, and now we deal more with RV failure and a Fontan kind of like situation. Current literature will report that each patient that gets a VAD, 70% of them will have one of these complications. 
um, are not out of the honeymoon phase with these devices in any uh, stretch. In terms of the standard medical therapy, so all are anticoagulated. We target an INR between two and three with warfarin. Um, all are placed on aspirin, either 81 or 325, depending upon the device. Uh, if the INR falls, we will use low molecular weight heparin to bridge them back, um, or if we're planning a, a procedure or device. So unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin is safe in these patients. We try to avoid vitamin K, mostly because it's unpredictable in how the patients are going to respond. If someone comes in with a super therapeutic INR, we prefer to try and transfuse if need, um, hold the warfarin, let the INR drift down, but we would prefer not to give vitamin K, unless obviously they're exsanguinating or FFP, but we've had some instances where the the administration of vitamin K was followed by device thrombus, which may or may not be related, but we try, just because of the unpredictability of it, not to use it. Again, we try and target a map between 70 and 90, um, and then all the standard heart failure medications apply. From a practical standpoint, the device, it weighs about 3.6 pounds when you include all the battery packs and everything else, give or take. Um, the patients cannot be submerged in water, so no swimming, no bathtubs, uh, nothing that can, can submerge the drive line in water. They can take showers, but they have to wrap them the drive line site with cellophane. Uh, and we've had complications with that in terms of people damaging drive lines as they try and take the cellophane off. Uh, obviously, no contact sports. <laughs> uh, they cannot have an MRI. These devices are not MRI compatible. Um, they can travel, so when they go home, they're given travel documents by us so that they can go through security. They generally don't go through the metal detector, but, but um, but they certainly can travel. We tend to notify sites where they're going so that they know they're in the area. So if they say we're going to Vancouver for a week, we'll give their clinic a call and just say, hey, we've got one of our bad patients in your area for the next little while, just as a, a heads up. Um, they can drive. So the current driving guidelines from the CCS um, state that if they are NYHA class one to three and they've been stable for more than two months post are eligible to drive a personal, um, not drive commercially. Um, just sort of a recent outcome data, this is from 2014, this is our, our, our Interac Intermax data from the U.S. Um, um, so uh, their 80% uh, survival is one year with the device, however, uh, complications are frequent, as I said, up to 70% of patients. Four-year survival in, the inter in this report um, was about 50%, um, and as I said previously, um, Close to half of the de devices in the U.S. are becoming destination um, devices. Um, this is an area that we are just starting to embark upon, but we do not have a, a large destination program at this time. Um, so uh, in summary, um, the LVADs, um, they are a therapy to prolong life in patients with end-stage heart um, failure. Most patients, I think, probably do have an improvement in their quality of life. However, it certainly is not without complications. Um, when you see them, they will not have a pulse. Um, if in doubt, give fluid. Um, always look at the pump parameters um, and trend them. And that's the most probably useful thing on a day-to-day -day basis if you're seeing them on, on the boards. Um, and we have a LVAD coordinator from eight to five that's always available and a transplant advanced heart failure cardiologist that's always available to happily, happily answer questions along with our perfusions. Probably, um, the most well-educated on the nitty-gritty mechanical. Happy to answer any questions. Dr.